To my amazement, I found boundary lines vanishing and points of contact emerging between the realms of the living and the non-living. Inorganic matter was perceived as anything but inert. It was a thrill under the action of multitudinous forces. J.C. Bose from Autobiography of a Yogi J.C. Bose was born on November 30th, 1858, a Bengali, a famed biologist, physicist, and botanist, founder of the first interdisciplinary research center in Asia, and a pioneer in radio pharmacology and botany. He strongly opposed any patenting on his inventions, and only did once out of peer pressure. In 2004, he was voted the seventh greatest Bengali of all time in a BBC poll. Like many of history's most important scientists, J.C. Bose is lesser known. Although not directly described in detail in his publications, J.C. Bose discovered a universal force presiding over organic and inorganic matter. Throughout his career, Bose made multiple attempts to puzzle out his discovery by measuring the EM fields of animal, plant, and inorganic samples, as well as the incredibly minute movements of plants using the crescograph, a device of his own invention. As an Indian-born scientist, Bose saw a natural pairing between the Western scientific method and ancient Indian philosophy, a sentiment that can be strongly inferred while reading his publications. The investigations which have just been described may possibly carry us one step further, proving to us that these things are determined not by the play of an unknowable and arbitrary vital force, but by the working of laws that know no change, acting equally and uniformly throughout the organic and the inorganic worlds. J.C. Bose, Response in the Living and Non-Living, published 1902. By testing for laws of uniformity across living and non-living matter, Bose may have been investigating the old yogic idea that consciousness evolves as it passes through matter, the first stage being mineral, then plant, animal, and finally human. Before inventing the crescograph in 1919, Bose experimented on samples of matter by measuring fluctuations in their electromagnetic fields. Here, we can see a diagram from one of his books in 1902, detailing how the electromagnetic field of an animal muscle was determined. By suspending the muscle as indicated here, with clamps attaching the muscle to a galvanometer located here, a tracing needle attached to the galvanometer would record fluctuations in the sample's EM field on plate glass that Bose referred to as reflex arcs. If you don't know already, a galvanometer is simply a crude version of an ammeter used today and measures electrical current. The arc patterns created by the galvanometer in Bose's early experiments often matched significantly across organic and inorganic samples, giving rise to Bose's popularity. Bose typically used four external stimuli to test EM fluctuations. Torsion, tapping, burning, and the application of a reagent such as chloroform. Here, we can see some of Bose's EM readings taken over 100 years ago. And here, we can see an example of the significantly similar readings taken on a piece of muscle and a carrot from Bose's backyard. Later, in 1919, Bose invented the crescograph in an attempt to further push the limits of his ability to observe the infinitesimally small variations in matter. 
Although typically used in the pursuit to discover a central nervous system in plants, the Cresco graph could measure movements in any piece of matter at a magnification of 10,000 times in practical usage. Bose interpreted his results in terms of fatigue, excitement, depression, and death. Describing a piece of inorganic metal as being dead or fatigued would at best be seen as merely metaphorical in modern times. Yet, once again in Autobiography of a Yogi, the author witnesses an experiment using the Cresco graph by Bose and writes, Deeply engrossed, I watched the graph which recorded the characteristic waves of atomic structure. When the professor applied chloroform to the tin, the vibratory writings stopped. They recommenced as the metal slowly regained its normal state. My companion dispensed a poisonous chemical. Simultaneous with the quivering end of the tin, the needle dramatically wrote on the chart a death notice. Bose instruments have demonstrated that metals, such as the steel used in scissors and machinery, are subject to fatigue and regain efficiency by periodic rest. The life pulse in metals is seriously harmed or even extinguished through the application of electric currents or heavy pressure. As a lover of botany, much of Bose's work centered around discovering the central nervous system of plants. After all, if a plant was able to tangibly respond to external pain, surely a nervous system must exist to interpret the pain and react accordingly. But after painstaking studies, Bose was unable to find a central nervous system in plants. Positing through his books that there's a connection between physiochemical reactions occurring on a molecular level and his electromagnetic readings. Researchers in Bose often overlook the inconclusive nature of his study, which, like any good discovery, asks more questions than it answers. If a relationship exists between any object of matter and its electromagnetic field, then what is the conduit between the two? The recordings of electromagnetic fluctuation would possibly be only another byproduct of external stimuli. A byproduct that was useful to measure since it shows incredibly small fluctuations in a sample's physical state. And if the same reflex arcs are recorded on mineral, plant, and animal samples, then a force outside of all three samples must be affecting not only the electromagnetic field, but also matter itself as this mystery force acts as a conduit between the seen and the unseen. Remember, the plant and mineral samples reacted similarly to animal samples without the use of a central nervous system. If a central nervous system isn't required to feel fatigue or excitement, then are we humans any better than the roads we drive on? Or just another form of the same creational substance expressed in a different color of life. Perhaps Bose's work could be used to prove ancient Chinese notions of qi, Indian prana, and the modern idea of auras. In a practical everyday observation, I believe many of us have already been witness to Bose's all-encompassing life force. Have you ever heard of a computer acting haywire, only to resume its normal function after its operator gives it a compliment or a hug? or a person pleading with a car to start up, only for it to suddenly turn over? Or how about the story by famed Theravadan Buddhist monk Ajahn Brahm, who described a college student that gave a passing kind word to an ATM every day, and subsequently received a $20 bill from the same machine for no apparent reason? At what point does matter change into another uniquely different object? No one can point to the exact moment when minerals become plants or plants dissolve within human digestion. Instead, we have shades of existence as each object, whether human or armchair, is in a perpetual transition from one form to the next. An object is defined as a uniquely separate object 
only because of the viewer's ignorance. An ignorance that blinds him from the item's past and future states. Moving the clock back far enough, we can see that each atomic arrangement on planet Earth is in fact gaseous star stuff in the temporary transitional arrangement that we recognize as life. So should it come as a surprise that minerals, plants, and animals all react similarly under the crescograph? To an immortal being, the plant was a collection of minerals long before it was a plant and will eventually return to being a mineral. If we were to speak more accurately, we would say the minerals are experiencing the temporary state of a plant. From this grander perspective, we must admit that the concept of separation is an illusion based on ignorance of sight. This is why the Buddha says, the cause of all pain and suffering is ignorance. And, in his ignorance of the whole truth, each person maintains his own arrogant point of view. Going even deeper, if nothing is separate as Bose's research infers, then what is God? God could then be viewed as the summation of all things. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To truly create a summation of all things, both extremes, alpha and omega, need to be combined, creating a zero sum, nothing. This leads to a plethora of contradictions and takes us into the mind of ancient philosophers that wrote puzzling sentences such as, the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao, Lao Tzu. Wrapping your mind around God thus requires holding opposites as being equal to one another, producing a contradiction. This contradiction, however, acts as a gatekeeper to the first of many revelatory thoughts. When the Alpha and Omega are forced together in the mind like two repelling magnets, the mental friction they create reveals the infinite middling truth that stands between the beginning and the end, opening the door for existence to exist. The hallmark signature of such middling truth being found in the work of the pioneering scientist J.C. Bose, who found a fingerprint touching everything. If you enjoyed this video and would like to learn more about this symbol, then please subscribe and stay posted for the next installment in this series. Also, if it's not too much trouble, I would appreciate if you left a comment and liked this video. It goes a long way to helping me reach a much larger audience. Thank you, and have a good day.